Um, oh, sorry. So I put it in place. This is our sump right here. Um, so I put it right next to the sump so we could just have this really easy overflow back into the sump. Um, it's hard to see. Maybe up here. Oh. So this is our header tank up here, this tank up above. And I just had a siphon that comes out of that, and that's the water coming into the tank. Um, so it's kind of scary when I think about it now, because if we lose power, um, that header tank, the water volume drops, and then that siphon is broken. So in Florida, we had a lot of storms, and there's always the possibility that we're going to lose power. But fortunately, that didn't happen during this time. Um, we'll definitely be working to optimize this whole set up for the future runs, but, um, but yeah, so that day, put the eggs in the bucket, put this whole thing together, um, and then we stock the eggs. And uh, over the next two days, I, we'll, we'll, I was planning on adding more eggs to it if we got them. It, it works for us just because um, this size tank, we haven't really been working with them before, but to get the numbers of eggs that we really want to stock something that's big, volumetrically, um, we, we've been stocking several days worth of eggs. So it ended up that the following day I got 2,000 eggs, which was super disappointing. Uh, but then that third day I got 25,000 eggs. So I stocked that one as well. So we started this run with 50,000 eggs, um, which is kind of crazy. We've never stocked that many eggs in the tank before. Um, but yeah, so. Uh, same thing, so the, the flow rate, um, we had already talked with Chad, we knew about what we should be looking for in terms of, you know, turnover if we were going to try to replicate that. Um, I set this up so fast, I just turned the valve about halfway and went with it. And uh, we never touched it again throughout the run. And it turned out that we set 10 liters a minute, which is insane. Um, so it had 15 tank turnovers a day. So this thing was just cranking with water. Um, we had some moderate aeration there. Um, we followed their same lighting schedule. We, we had already been on a 14 hour lighting schedule, 1410, um, but they had success with 16.8, so we just went with that. Uh, 28 degrees was the best that I could do. We have this very small AC unit that's, we're actually looking at upgrading that as well right now. But that thing's cranking 24 7, and 28 degrees is as low as I can get. Um, I'd like to be able to do lower. But. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting is down here, this nitrate. So our system is completely recirculating, um, and nitrate builds. And we're inland uh, enough that we can't just dump the water. So our nitrates build, and we have to deal with it. Um, but it, it, what, what's interesting about it, and what I like about it, is that for so long with this tang, you know, puzzle, we always wonder if, you know, nitrates might be too high and that may be a problem, or um, our water source, we use all, all of our water is in an ocean, um, so it's really cool just to be able to say that we were able to use something like that and have it work. Um, so, this is a sort of rough outline of our feeding parameters. Um, it follows what they did in Hawaii very closely. Uh, we used the L-strain rotifer, and so you can see here um, in the early days when we first started feeding rotifers, um, we were size sitting them. Probably 90-95% of the culture sits up on like a 100 micron screen, so we had to have a lot of rotifers to be able to get uh, the densities that we needed um, that would go through that screen. So we're, we now actually just got from, from Reed, we got the S-strain rotifer that we're starting to bloom up and we're going to use that for the next run. Um, so we fed three times daily and that was actually probably more of a, um, a product of our flow rates because we would have liked to have followed more along the line of Chad's schedule, but uh, by noon, most of the food was already flushed out. Um, uh, our, our, um, the algae that we were using to, uh, to shade the water, we were using tetrasomus and then symbiogenium. It's, uh, it's it, what is it? It's the algae that, um, that you infect corals with. 
It's the so, yeah, the Zosian Deli, sorry. Yeah. Um, it's something that we have on site for a completely different project, working with corals. Um, but it was just an algae that we had enough of that we could use it for some shading. So I don't think it has anything to do with the protocol, but it's just, uh, I'm telling you because we, we used it. Um, so uh, we used two different enrichments as well, just like they didn't want it. Ours were a little bit different. We used Ore 1. Um, as, an, as sort of a diet and an enrichment, and then we also used the Automat 3050. And then um, as they got older here, we started them on to enrich our team with the Automat. Um, so just to give you sort of a, a snapshot, um, I don't really have the entire larval protocol, um, but I just, I was going through my notes while I was on the plane, and, um, and these were, feeding parameters for just one day. Um, it was a lot of work and looking over the notes gave me some anxiety. <laughs> I think I put it out of my mind just how much work it was and how stressful it was and how awful it was. Um, so looking through the notes day by day it was just, it's too much. Um, but yeah, so, so we were doing three feedings a day. We'd come in in the morning, we'd feed them parvo naps. Um, it was basically whatever we were harvesting. So we were just trying to push our cultures to the max, and we would feed that out. Um, rotifers, we were a little bit more, well, we could do those a little bit better, so we were able to hit numbers that we wanted. Um, so we were, at, at 26 days, we were feeding 3 million. Um, the same, the general micro diets, um, that's just something we had. But yeah, so just a, a very intense schedule is sort of the, the theme here. I, I added it up and we did 10, 210 million parvo naps over the 37 days that we were feeding parvo, which is just ridiculous. Um, and then 205 million rotifers. So this is sort of, it's not complete, but it's mostly complete of our, our parvo. Um, Series. <coughs> Starting with A, going down to this is 54 days post hatch. We started seeing the blue uh, right about 49 days was the first ones started making that transition. Um, this guy is somewhere in that, uh, what would that be, about 45 days, so just before they started turning blue. Um, this is a video. So, um, I talked about it last year a little bit, but the otolith data, where you can have an idea of, um, based on wild data, we can have an idea of when the larvae switch from being pelagic to being down onto the reef. And we always knew that 40 days was sort of a, um, a milestone that we were looking for, and that's, according to the wild data, when these things switch from pelagic to benthic. Um, and what we didn't know was that they would be clear when they did that, but it makes sense that they do that first and then they switch, um, you know, they start to color up. But, so for this one, we, we knew that date, we had it in mind, it was July 4th. Um, and I went into work that day and peered over the edge of the tank and I didn't see the larvae up the surface like I had been for the past 40 days, um, which freaked me out because they're supposed to be there. And uh, peered farther, didn't see you know, little silver sides on the bottom of the tank, which would be, you know, dead ones, so I was, okay. Um, but I still couldn't find them, and as it turned out, um, the way that the tank was set up, um, so we put, we put some, uh, some coral structure in there for them, um, the same idea as what they did in Hawaii, uh, but they never really seemed to be interested in it. And what you're looking at here is the inlet pipe for the tank is right up here somewhere, four feet up, obviously. But the water shoots straight down, and this is that corner of the tank where the water's hitting. And on that 40, 40th day, um, I found a little pile of larvae, about 15 of them, that were all sitting right underneath the flow, just picking off food as it's coming down in the flow. So they really just seem to love that, that water movement. It's like a, just a food delivery system for them. Uh, so this was actually the first one that started switching over to blue. Um, and 
it's cool because you can, yeah. It, it, was, it was annoying because um, we had so many different people that would come into the room, because it was, it was obviously exciting as it was happening, all the way from you know, 20 days. Um, and we would have so many people say, you know, they were turning blue at 22, 23, 24 days. And it's like, well, you know, they're, they're sort of opaque, and you could, you know, they're not orange, but they're definitely not blue either. Um, but this was the first time that we could really identify the, the blue coloration starting. Um, and you can see it compared to the other part. Okay? So um, this was 49 days. Um, and we had moved them into a glass aquarium. Um, they were, they're, they're essentially fish at this point. They're very robust. They, we, we didn't lose any after, uh, I want to say it was 35 or 36 days. Um, so they had been pretty stable for a while. Uh, so this was just something I wanted to touch on, which was pretty cool. Um, so that was 49 days when we first started seeing just a little bit of blue. But, and, and that was a Friday, and then I came back in on Monday, and I put um, that, that fish that was the most blue, I put it in a photo tank, and started snapping some photos of it. And I was trying, you know, with flash, without flash, all sorts of different things. And I started out without a flash, and that's, these were the photos that I was getting, and that's about what I was seeing with the naked eye. And then um, I turned the flash on, and this happened. And I looked down at my camera, and I was just blown away, because that's not what I was seeing with the naked eye at all. Um, all that blue on the back side of the fish was just not there. And so we started looking into it, and um, basically this blue pigmentation, it's what's known as structural coloration, or it's like iridophores. Um, so they're, uh, basically they're like cells that reflect like mirrors, um, and in, in this case, they specifically reflect that blue light, um, and everything else just passes through. And it's structural because the cells develop in layers. So what we were seeing here was some of the very first layers starting to develop. And so in, without the flash or without that real bright light, they would, you could see right through them. But if you gave it enough light with that flash, all those little cells flash back blue. So it was really cool. I took the photos over to the computer and I showed my boss and he thought I was using Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> so he had to go see it for himself. Uh, this is just a photo that I took. So, um, yeah. um, so I'll talk a little bit about our systems and you know what, what we do. Um, it's very similar to what they're doing in Hawaii. It, our our cocoa pods in particular, it's on a smaller scale though. Um, this this room is has a has a normal sized door to it, and so we could only bring tanks in as big as what we could fit through the door. So that's why we have the tank size that we do. Um, so if you can see back here, this is sort of a um, adaptation of what they're doing in Hawaii in terms of. Uh, the culture method. So this is our little uh, tank that we're using. He's got it flipped upside down right now because the run is over and he's starting to clean things up. We were we basically limped to the finish line with this run, so to speak. I mean, we were pushing our systems to the max to try to get everything that we needed. Um, so we're in a recovery mode right now. Um, but yeah, so we adapted that that technology. It worked really well for us. Um, the, my favorite part about it is that I come in the morning at Eight o'clock, and the Napoli are already, already ready to be fed out to the fish. Um, so the light isn't on for hours while we're trying to collect over, you know, with the, the airlift collectors or something like that, taking time um, where the fish just have nothing in the water to feed on. Um, so as you can see here, um, before I left for France, um, Eric had start, started adapting this technology. He's rebuilding his whole cover pod system around it. Um, so we had all this filtration out of the room, and then I came back, got this huge spawn, and we said, we're moving on. So this is still there, all of his stuff. He basically tore his room apart, and then he hasn't been able to build it back together. Um, so we've just been working in sort of a crazy environment for a while. Um, yeah, so like I said, all of our, all of our water, our water source is RL water that we mix instant ocean. Um, so it's really great to validate that there's nothing wrong with using this motion. Because um, every, every time we have a major you know, the rising tide conference and things like that, um, we get all these industry partners that come and they say, why don't you try our salt? Why don't you try our mix? Why don't you try something different? And we 
have chased that. We've gone down that rabbit hole, but it never really came down. So we've just stuck with this and dug this notion. Um, this is our restock filtration. We actually recently redone that. So I used to have three separate systems. Um, none of them were very good. So I tore it all out and I built one system that works a little bit better. Um, it was designed to implement ozone, which we haven't actually done yet. So it's there's still issues with it, but we're working on that. Um, this is our Brewstock tanks. So you can see them here. Uh, the tanks are uh, like 750 gallons. Um, and then they have that sort of overflow into a, a smaller sump, and that's where we do the egg collection. So we put, we just hang a bucket right on that overflow there. The bucket has some 300 micron screen glued on the sides of it, windows cut out of it. Um, so it's a pretty basic system. Uh, these are my root stock. Um, uh, them here. Uh, so I have two populations of root stock, two populations of blue tank root stock. This is one of them. There's 15 fish in this tank. Um, they're, they're newer. I've had them since uh, 2014. We get them in at about 10 centimeters, which is based on the literature that's uh, about 10 months old, and it's also sexually reproductive. Uh, 10 months um, for this species is the egg production isn't quite what it is with an older fish, but they are sexually reproductive that early. Um, so we've had these guys for a couple years now, and then I have another population of just three fish, and those three fish are the ones that produced all of the eggs for the run that we did. Um, so it's one male, two females, so everything came from three fish. Um, so most of you in the room now know this guy, Larry DuPont. Um, he approached me in 2014. Uh, he was this crazy guy with this crazy food that he said I needed to try. So I started using it. Um, and as of now, it's the only thing I'm feeding to the blue tank breed stock. Um, it's super convenient, like Andy was talking about. So, you know, for me, we, we have two people that are intricately involved in this project, and I don't really have time to sit there and chop a whole bunch of seafood. And the other thing is, he's got so much stuff in there that if I wanted to add something to their diet, it's probably already in there. So I just go with it, and it's worked pretty well for us. So. Um, and then the last thing is just, you know, we're not done yet. So. Uh, our, our facility, the Tropical Aquaculture Lab, we sort of have a, a reputation in the area, more so with the freshwater side of things, of um, being able to complete species that have never been raised in captivity before, but then be able to figure out how to transfer that technology to industry. Um, it's something that they've done for a really long time, and we plan to do it with this species as well. Uh, so that means repeating it a lot, refining the protocol, um, and we're really excited about it because, I mean, the fact that we were able to do this as quickly as we were from what we learned with what they're doing in OI, um, we think the potential is definitely there. Um, we learned a lot about the different bottlenecks in their development, uh, we learned a lot of the mistakes that we made, and we now have something that we can use to move forward and try to improve on it. So. And this was cool too, so I was, this was, actually took this on the plane, but I was going over, these were Eric's feeding notes, and somewhere along the way during the trial, he actually wrote this. This was our best run, and it turned out to be more than just that, so it was pretty exciting. And that is it. Um, yeah, so contact information if you guys want to reach out. Um, obviously, we're still in the infancy of knowing what we need to do to move forward with this, but um, if you have any questions, feel free.